JT. Welcome to the command post. You know what it is. Post up and take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. And uh, today we're going to talk about a few topics. Uh, let's get the elephant out of the room quickly. Uh, this will be the last time we'll have to discuss this. And this is the way I like it. Uh, this is the way it should have been a lot sooner. We shouldn't have even been in this predicament where this had to happen now after something transpired that caused a bit of a media firestorm. But nonetheless, whatever, you know, limps that had to be taken and measures had to be taken to get us to this point, it's been done. Ron Rivera fined Jack Del Rio $100,000. And, and really for Jack Del Rio, that amounts to a slap on the wrist. Uh, it's not about the actual amount that he was fined. It was just the actual act of him being fined that you know delivered the message that needed to be delivered. And this is what should have transpired two years ago, last year. It shouldn't have gotten to this point. That was my whole point. For those of you out there that got stuck on whether you agree with Jack, you know, set sediments or not, I, that wasn't that was never the point. Jack is able to speak his mind, say whatever he feels. You don't have to agree with him. I don't agree with him, but that's not the point. The point was that this is a distraction. This didn't need to happen. And moving forward, it can't happen. And Ron Rivera finally said to Jack Del Rio, enough of this. We don't need this going forward. We've got enough shit on our plate. We don't need people inside the building adding to that. We've got enough of it going on as is. And so Jack Del Rio, and this is what you have to understand. This is why I didn't feel like this was so hard for Ron Rivera to nip this in the bud a long time ago. Jack Del Rio is a football lifer, okay? Football gave him his lifestyle, allowed him to play in the National Football League, make great money doing it. He, after his football career was done, went into coaching, okay? And then when he wasn't coaching, he had a media job working for ESPN because he was waiting for another opportunity to potentially get back into coaching, which he got here from Washington. He's one of those guys that's going to do this as long as he possibly can. As long as someone is willing to hire him and employ him, he's going to continue to work in the game of football because it's what he loves to do. It is his life, okay? He is a, uh, uh, a Wade uh, Phillips. He is a um, uh, 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 what's the other guy's name? You know, Vic Fangio. You know, these guys that have been in the game for so long, you know, they know nothing else but football. And so I can't see him jeopardizing that because he wants to continue to talk politics on social media. Like if you made him choose, he's going to choose being a football coach because he cares about that more. So I didn't understand why this was so hard from Ron Rivera to just say, hey, dude, knock it off which is essentially what he did. He, you know, the finding of $100,000 is that that's for the public. That's for the media so they could say that he was reprimanded. But you saw the end result. Jack Del Rio deleted his Twitter account. Like, it's done. It's over. We don't have to worry about this anymore. That was my whole point. Like, this is where this should have gone a year ago, two years ago. But it took us a while to get there. He had to say something that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. See, this is the shit that we didn't need. Like, you got the NCAA, uh, the NAACP uh, talking about he needs to be fired. Like, and I'm telling them, y'all go sit down, okay? This is always your move. You always want to, you want to go to the extreme. He does not need to be fired, but that's the kind of thing you don't need. You, you don't need that. You don't need Ed Reed talking about this is a guy that needs to be out of the league. You don't need that. That's why you don't, you don't allow this to happen if you're Ron Rivera. So Ron did what he needed to do. It took a while, uh, and I wasn't sure if he was going to do it or not. But this is what I thought he should have done, and I thought he should have done this a long time ago. He did it, and you see what the response was from Jack Del Rio because, again, Jack doesn't want to jeopardize his job. He's a football lifer. This is what he does, and he can't envision himself doing anything else. Now, you know, we'll see what happens in, in terms of is the defensive product better this year than it was in past years? Because it hasn't been great, if you ask me. And I'm looking for a monumental step. You know, all these excuses that they had about COVID and not having the secondary be on the same page, all that's out the window now. All that stuff, 
you can put to rest because you've had the full secondary there for the entire OTAs. Chase Young showed up this year. I don't want to hear any excuses. Get this defense on par and get these guys up to speed and get the defense playing better because I think the offense is going to be better. And if the defense is able to at least meet them where they are, then this team is going to have a chance to win double-digit games, make the postseason, and make some noise uh, in the postseason, potentially, if they can stay relatively healthy as well. But um, that situation's done. We don't have to worry about that anymore. And that's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So we're done with that. We don't need to talk about it anymore. The team released two players today. Always when I see a guy or two being released, I always start thinking, hmm, to myself, self, wonder why they're releasing these guys because you don't have to make a move right now unless you're making space for someone else that you're looking to bring in. I've all along said that I expect them to still attack two particular positions on this football team. I expect them to add a veteran linebacker, and I also expect them to add a veteran defensive tackle. Now, uh, I know a lot of you talked about Anthony Barr, and I thought he was still in the, uh, with the Minnesota Vikings. Turns out he's a free agent. So when someone asks me about Anthony Barr and the rumors, and I dismiss them because I'm like, we're not trading for Anthony Barr. He's 30 years old. I don't see that being a guy that fits what they're trying to do. I'm like, nah, they're not trading anything for him. But then, you know, learning that he's a free agent, I still don't know how they would utilize him. But, you know, if that's a guy that they feel like they can bring in, Eh, that'd be interesting, but I still don't think that the uh, 30-year-old Anthony Barr is what Washington is looking to bring onto this roster, but I could be wrong. We'll see, but I do expect them to add a veteran linebacker. Anthony Barr does fit that criteria, so uh, we'll see. They released a, a undrafted defensive back Will Adams, and they also released place kicker Brian Johnson. Now, the Brian Johnson release is more significant than that of defensive back Will Adams because what that says to me is that they're sold on uh, our place kicker for the upcoming season because remember the last few years we haven't had any kicking competitions we've you know the last two in particular are like hey you should probably bring in another kicker to challenge Dustin Hopkins he hasn't been as stable as you would like him to be they didn't do it this year uh, Joey Sly going into the offseason made all of his kicks here in Washington to finish up the season and we felt like he was the unquestioned kicker, but they still had Brian Johnson on the roster. So I said, maybe they're having a little bit of a kicking competition just to make sure Joey Sly is the right man for the job. Turns out they feel really good about Joey Sly being the Sly guy. Doo -doo, doo -doo 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 -doo. Sly guy, Sly guy, he's a Sly guy. And our place kicker looks like he's going to be the unquestioned kicker going into camp. And rightfully so. Uh, I think he has earned the right to be in that position. And unless he does something otherwise, then I think uh, Joey Sly is the kicker and the right man for the job uh, for the time being. So Brian Johnson no longer here means that it's Joey Sly's job to lose. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's a little bit of news out of Ashburn. So I'm keeping my eye on what they may be potentially doing with the waiver wire and guys that are out there as free agents because they did just release two guys. And generally, when you move on two guys, that means you're looking to make two moves that counteract that. So we'll see what happens there. Um, let's talk about Terry McLaurin. So he's a no-show at training camp. We knew that this was a possibility um, or a mini camp, excuse me. I don't, I don't want to misspeak. It's not training camp. Training camp isn't until late July. Um, dates haven't been officially set for that, but we know that's right around the corner. These mini, um, mini camps right now. So we've got, um, these mini camps that are set for the next three days. Terry will not be in attendance for mini camp and that's okay. Um, I thought he would show up, you know, and you know, a lot of people are making a big deal out of, uh, about this. I've read things from the, the last two players that haven't shown up for mandatory minis where Albert Hainsworth in 2010 and Trent Williams in 2019 and both of those situations you saw how they ended up um, I, I, I don't look at Terry in that same light but I know when people want to go to the extreme those are the things you bring up um, because people are panicking and I've, so many fans are still panicking you know Wale is now chiming in saying hey give that man the bag he's going to get the bag trust me okay I'm not worried one bit this is how negotiations go if you've ever been in 
and an industry where this is commonplace, then you know. And I had a buddy of mine that was a, um, I think he was a, I think he was a, he was, I don't know, he wasn't a claims adjuster. Uh, but I, I, I do have a friend that's a claims adjuster, but he was a, he was a claim agent. And he always was in negotiations and he would always tell me about these things. And then when I look at the NFL and I look at how these things go, it's always content. It's always contentious. Okay. There, there's, there's your side, there's their side. And then there's in the middle somewhere you're hoping that you can meet there and they will. Again, I've talked about the importance of Terry McLaurin, what he means not only to this team on the field, but what he means to this organization off of the field. He's done it the right way in order. And Ron has already talked about in order to set the tone in a locker room, you have to pay the guys that have been here and done it the right way. That's how you do it in this league. I've talked about this already. Okay. You pay the guys that have done it the right way. Jonathan Allen was one of those guys. That's why they paid him. They tried to pay Brandon Sheriff. He didn't want to take the deal. So he's now in Jacksonville. They're going to pay Terry McLaurin. You have nothing to worry about. I am not worried one bit that he's not here. It sucks. You'd like him to be building a rapport with Carson Wentz, but he's not because he wants his money and rightfully so. And he's doing the things that we've seen people do in the past when they haven't gotten their money. So he can be fined. I think up to something like $95,000 uh, for missing these three days of minicamp. Um, the, the, the team has the authority to be able to not find him if they so choose. Uh, if you're looking to get a deal done, you're not going to find him, right? Okay. So I think that at the end of the day, they, they're going to get this deal done in July. I've been adamant about that. I'm I'm going to continue to be adamant about that. Yeah, we're going to hear that they're not close right now, which is what you're hearing that, you know, even though uh, ongoing dialogue is happening, they're still kind of far apart. That's that's commonplace. Again, action is spurred by deadlines. OK, all right. So, again, as we get closer to training camp getting underway, that's when Washington's going to feel the heat and the pressure of saying, all right, we have to give this man what he's looking for, what he deserves. You know, they, they want to lowball Terry. And, and when I say lowball, they're, they're, they're not trying to sign him on a five year, $80 million deal because they know that's not going to happen, right? But they would like to get it around $100 million. So that five years, $100 million. And Terry's job and his camp's job is to say, uh uh, no, you don't. You, you don't get my guy for uh, five years, $100 million. You don't get my guy for five years, $105 million anymore. That That's out of the window. Okay, I think the deal and it, it could be a four year deal. It could be a five year deal. We don't know what, what one of the hangups. It could be years. We saw in the Dax, uh, uh, Dak, Dallas situation with Dak Prescott that the years were the hangup. You know, Dak won at four, Dallas won at five. And that was one of the hangups was Dak was like, I want to be able to get another bite at the apple, you know, three years from now, four years from now. You want to keep me under contract for five more years. I want to get out of this thing so I can hit hit this thing one more time. So um, it could be because Jonathan Allen got a four year extension. So it could be as simple as, hey, I want four years. You want to give me five years. I want to be able to come back and hit this thing again when you know I'm 30 years old. You want to try to keep me in this contract till I'm 31, and and that may be where the disconnect is. Ultimately, I think, and I've read this, and it makes sense to me. Um, that I think the deal, what it's going to take to get it done, five years, $115 million. So that would put Terry at a AVV or AAV, excuse me, of $23 million per year, which would put him sixth in the NFL behind Tyreek Hill, um, Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, DeAndre Hopkins, and um, A.J. Brown, who just got his deal from the Eagles, and he's averaging $25 million on a four-year, $100 million contract extension. So that would put him sixth. That's right around where Terry should be. Now, Terry's agent may argue, we need to be right there with A.J. Brown. Right there with A.J. Brown. 23 isn't close enough. How about 24? Okay, which would run that number up to five years, $120 million, right? If it's a five-year deal. If it's a four-year deal, then it would be 
four years, $96 million. That would put you at 24, right? However, again, if Terry Agent wants to play hardball, they want to be right there at the $25 million mark with A.J. Brown because they feel like they're just as good, if not better, than A.J. Brown is. There's a debate right now going around as to who's the best receiver in the NFC East, and it's between A.J. Brown, who just got here, and Terry McLaurin, who's been doing it in this division for the last three years. So if Terry's agent is looking at what A.J. Brown just got, he's going to tell Terry, you're worth every bit as much as A.J. Brown is, and we won't settle for anything less than $25 million per year. And then, you know, the pettiness sets in because not only do I want $25 million, I want to have 25 million, you know, 125,000 so that I'm just slightly above AJ Brown, which would put him in the, you know, five range, you know, four or five range in terms of average um, annual salary, right? Or average annual value is what AAV stands for. Um, so it's going to be somewhere in that neighborhood. One, if it's five years, 115 to 120. Okay, is where it's going to be somewhere could be even, you know, if he wants uh, 25 per year, then it'll be somewhere in that 115 to 125 range. I think that we can expand it to that range. Um, 125 would get you to 25 per, which would put you right on par with A.J. Brown. Um, And then I think the two numbers that matter to Terry the most, and I couldn't be misspeaking here. I don't know this for a fact. I cannot confirm nor deny this. The two numbers that probably mean the most to Terry are... AAV, which is annual uh, uh, average value, right? And the amount of guarantees. So with that 115 to $125 million deal, you're looking at anywhere from 54, you know, to 60, maybe $62 million in guarantees, depending on high, how high we go uh, in overall, you know, aggregate. So you know, the 125 number, the number of the total deal really is insignificant in the grand scheme of things because nobody usually gets the entire contract. Uh, the number is what it is for the agent's sake. But at the end of the day, the player really cares about two things, where he ranks among his peers in terms of how much he's being paid per year and how much of this am I actually taking home no matter what, guarantees, right? Right. So those are the things you care about because after you don't have any more guarantee money on the books, the team can do whatever the hell they want to do with you, right? So guarantee, Jonathan Allen, you heard him speak about that. Like, hey, I don't have any guarantee money two years after, you know, down the road. So, you know, anything could happen and and players think in those terms. So Terry wants his money. And remember, Terry's not a first round pick. So Terry hasn't had real money in his career yet. So Terry's not going to settle because he doesn't know if there's another contract coming after this, which there probably will be if he continues to play at the level that we know he's capable of. But Terry's also had a concussion in his career. Knock on wood, right? So we know that anything can happen. This sport is violent. This sport is stands for not for long. So you got to get yours while it's there to be got. And so Terry's going to get his money, but he's not going to settle for anything less than what he thinks he's worth. So that's, that's going to be the negotiation side, all right? The guaranteed money, which I think could get as high as $62 million if you go to the $25 million, $125 million realm. I think if it's around 115, then it's down to around 54. If you end up at the 120 threshold where you meet in the middle of that 25 and that 23 right at 24, then I think you might be in that 58, 59 range in terms of guaranteed dollars. We'll see what happens. That's my guess at what's going on right now is Washington wants him closer to that 110, five for 110, which is 22. And Terry's camp is like, nah, we're, we're five at 125. That's where we're at. And, they, they're, and, and really, if you want to get to that point, you don't start there if you're Terry's camp. You start at, hey, we're, five, we're at five for 135. Clearly, he's not getting that. And then you let them talk you down to where you ultimately want to be, which is five for 125. So they'll, they'll come to an agreement somewhere, whether it's that, you know, magical. I think 24 is the magical number, you know, 24 per year on a five year deal, which would be 120. I think that's the magical number that should get the deal done. But again, how petty does Terry and his agent want to be? Do you want to make more than A.J. Brown because you think he's better? If that's the case, go get your money. So we'll see what happens. And then lastly, 
we can talk about Terry all we want, but until he actually signs, the real conversation should be around Carson Wentz. Because to me, everything that we want to accomplish this season in particular, and really moving forward, hinges upon the play of Carson Wentz. The reason that we're excited about the upcoming season, a lot of you don't want to admit it because you don't want to fall for the banana in the tailpipe that is Carson Wentz, and I totally get that. You've done this before. You've gotten excited about a quarterback coming here, whether it's Alex Smith or, you know, whatever the case may be, Case Keenum. I don't know how you could have been excited about that. Or you got excited about Ryan Fitzpatrick. Whatever the case may be, a lot of you don't want to allow yourself to feel like he's the guy and then be let down again, okay? A lot of you don't want to set yourself up for disappointment. Totally get it. But you have to be honest with yourself. The reason that you're allowing yourself to, uh, to dream or for people like myself to start talking reckless about winning 10, 11 games, 12 possibly if everything falls right for this team and they take advantage of opportunities, stay relatively healthy, all the things that the teams that win big games in this league do, is because we got Carson Wentz. If we were going into this season with Taylor Heineke as the quarterback, or we were thinking about starting a rookie quarterback in um, Sam Howell. You wouldn't be talking about 10, 11 wins, potentially 12 if everything falls in line for this team. You'd be saying, all right, you know, got a young quarterback. We expect growing pains. We're probably going to have, you know, you know, ups and downs and, and we'll see what we have. But winning, you know, eight, nine games would be great. That would be your outlook if Sam Howell was going to be the starter. And if Heineke was a starter, you'd say, you know what? I don't know what the hell's going to happen, but the best that we could probably do is 10 wins. Best we could do. But more likely than not, with Haneke's up and down play, it'll be eight or nine. So because Carson Wentz is here and you know what he's capable of and you've seen him work before, he used to shred our ass every year. You're saying, hey, we can win 11 games potentially. We can win 10. Maybe even 12. Wentz is the key to everything that we want to unlock this season. So while everybody's fixated on Terry, and rightfully so, because he's a huge part of what we want to do offensively, keep this in mind. Carson Wentz is the key to unlocking the success of this season. As he goes, the rest of this team goes. Even if the defense is disgustingly bad, again, like they were last season at the beginning of the year, if the offense is good enough to outduel teams, we can still win double-digit games. That's something we haven't been able to say for the last couple of years because we haven't had good enough quarterback play. And really, we haven't been able to outduel teams since Kirk was here back in 2016. The 2017 season, we didn't have enough weapons. Once Pierre and Deshaun left, we didn't have enough weapons. So that 2017 season, that wasn't really a, a good barometer for what Kirk had been. 16 and 15 were the years where we could outscore teams. If you wanted to take it there, we could take it there with you. You want to score 30 plus? We could do that. Remember, this is the same Kirk Cousins that outdueled Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers on a Sunday night. The same, same Kirk Cousins led offense that smoked teams during that stretch in 15 and 16 and put up points. Now, the defense wasn't all that great. And the offense was inconsistent. We weren't always, uh, you know, assured that we would be able to outdo teams, but we were capable. We haven't been capable of doing that with Alex Smith or Case Keenum or Dwayne Haskins, okay? Or Taylor Heineke. We, we were capable of doing that in certain instances, but it was, again, inconsistent, sort of like when Kirk was here, just inconsistent, not knowing if we were going to be able to outdo a team or not. We're going to be in that same spot with, with Carson, Carson Wentz. The difference is we got a lot more talent than Kirk ever had. And definitely what we had last year with Taylor Heineke and Alex Smith the year prior. So everything is here, but the key is going to be the play of Carson Wentz. So listening to Wentz talk about, hey, I've, I've talked to Terry. I'm in constant communication with him. I know he's going to be ready. I told you those two are going to be like two peas in a pod because they're so alike. Very religious backgrounds, down-to-earth dudes. They get it. Jonathan Allen has already talked about 
Carson Wentz being a leader and saying, look, man, you know, dudes get bad raps in this league for whatever reason. The media will drive a narrative and all of a sudden a dude is getting a bad rap. And he said, I, I, I just don't see it with this dude. Carson Wentz is a leader. He's made it a, a concerted effort to, to befriend every player on this team, you know, defensive, offensive, special teams. Guy that might not be here in, you know, three weeks. A guy that, you know, is going to be here for the long haul. Doesn't matter. He's made himself available to every single player. And he's been a, a hell of a teammate. He's shown leadership already. I expect Carson Wentz to have a C on his chest when this season gets underway. That's the kind of impact he's had already. So I know some of you are still skeptical and you have every right to be. But if this season is going to be the way that we want it to be, if we want it to turn out to be a winning season where we go to the postseason and potentially win a game or two, Wentz is going to be the key. Yeah, the defense needs to be good. Yeah, we need to be able to rely on our place kicker and, and Joey Sly. But it's all really going to come down to Carson Wentz's ability to stabilize the quarterback position. And if he can do that with all the talent that we have, we're going to have a chance. So anyway, uh, what do you guys think about the Terry situation? Are you still are you panicking even more so now that he didn't show up for minicamp? What, what, where, where are you on that? What do you think about Carson Wentz? Are you still on the fence? Do you believe in him? Um where are you with his situation and anything else under the sun you want to leave in the comment section leave it down in the comment section can't wait to hear from you guys so that's going to do it for me your man louis t i am a washington fan etched in burgundy and gold my washington spirit will never die washington spirit will never fold until we meet again post up and take command you guys have a good one take care and if i don't see you before then i'll see you on probably Wednesday night because the NBA Finals is going to be on Thursday this week. So I'll see you on Wednesday night for the Command Post Live. Until then, you guys, have a good one. Mm -hmm.